Hello, and welcome to an introductory look at converting lawns, specifically suburban and urban lawns, into more sustainable meadow, prairie, and natural landscapes. Now, I could start out by telling you a chemistry joke, but I know I wouldn't get a reaction. So let's just go uh, dive right in. We are gonna talk about reimaginings and uh, imaginations and revitalization today. This is what we need to see more of in, in suburbia for sure. Less of the left and the right, more in the middle. Connecting habitats because we have all these natural corridors in all of our neighborhoods. Um, if we can just link them together a little bit more, extend them a little bit into the suburban core of lawns and streets, we'll be doing a lot of good for wildlife and for ourselves. Now we do have a lawn problem in this country. If you take all the amount of lawn in the United States in the lower 48, it will equal the size of Georgia roughly. We use 20 trillion gallons of water to irrigate those lawns. And by comparison, this is a scary number to be, we use 30 trillion gallons of water used for all US food crops together. So look at that, two thirds of what we use to produce our own food, we use just on lawns that we you know we maybe walk on occasionally, kick a ball around on occasionally, and the dog goes out to take a poop. 5,000 acres per day are converted to lawn in the United States. By comparison, Amazon rainforest is losing 10,000 acres per day. So that's scary in the Amazon. It's just mind boggling what's going on down there. And look at that, we're doing half of that in our own country right here, converting to sterile monoculture lawnscapes. Now, uh, uh, I, I, this is going to be a cheery talk. <laughs> of 30 commonly used lawn pesticides, 19 linked to cancer, 13 to birth defects, 21 to reproductive disorders, and 15 to brain damage. Of those common chemicals, 17 are detected in groundwater, 11 are toxic to bees, and 16 are toxic to birds. Uh, now, idling a leaf blower, we all know leaf Blow blowers are a scourge, or so are lawnmowers, but idling a leaf blower for 10 minutes produces as much toxic exhaust as driving a large pickup truck for 235 miles. So I can't remember if this study was like a Ford F-150 or something, but it was, it was a big pickup truck. Um, and as you all know, chemicals coming out of these, these uh, machines, lawnmowers and leaf blowers, um, they're going to increase your hypertension. And for men, they're going to lower, lower your sperm count. So if you're trying to reproduce, uh, stop mowing your lawn. Yeah, that's the way to look at it. Now, less than 2% of the original tall grass prairie remains in North America, which makes it what the, uh, more threatened than the Amazon and in Indonesian rainforest combined, and actually the most threatened landscape uh, in the entire world. 70% of all U.S. grasslands, so that's tall grass, mixed grass, and short grass, are probably going to be gone by 2100. Just mind-boggling, isn't it? Here's the extent of the original Great Plains. You will see maps that are a little bit different. Uh, we obviously have prairies and meadows, extensive ones, and certainly historical ones that are extensive in every U.S. state. So it's not like prairie is just uh, in, in, in the middle of the country because it absolutely is not. It is everywhere. And sometimes that looks like a savanna. Sometimes it looks like a coastline prairie, but they are everywhere. So anyway, this is the original extent the map we're going to go with. This is everything that's been converted. So all the brown is what's converted. So it's mostly soy and corn fields, and it's just gone now forever. Uh, this is what's left. So the dark green is fairly decent intact habitat. You can see that nice green strip in eastern Kansas, uh, which is the Flint Hills tall grass prairie remnant. One quarter of the state of Nebraska is the Sand Hills prairie, very hard to farm on sand. So it's mostly used for grazing. So it's, it's, it's kept fairly intact. Um, South Dakota, that now, since this is about a 10 year old, oh, look, 16 year old map, uh, South Dakota and North Dakota have, have transformed so, so much more in that time span because it's, it's 2020, 2021 right now. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if half of that has gone in South Dakota. If you are a monarch butterfly fan, you want to see things being differently here. Um, most monarch butterflies, I mean, their, their main reproduction area is that yellow circle spot and where the dark green is. So Illinois, Iowa, Southern Wisconsin, Southern Minnesota, uh, Eastern Nebraska, Eastern South Dakota, Eastern North Dakota. So these are areas where most of the monarchs reproduce and they spread out from there in the summer months before they migrate south into Mexico in September and October. 
So yeah, kids today, they're going to see 35% fewer butterflies and moss than their parents did 40 years ago. If there was ever a tattoo to get, maybe that one's it. We have 50% fewer birds than we do for, than we did 40 years ago. Now, 230 North American bird species are at risk of extinction. With decades, they, within decades, they will be at risk. 96% of songbirds feed only insects to their young, right? So we're talking, we need habitat to create the insects that birds need. Um, it's, it, these, are, these are the trophic levels, right? Everything is interconnected. Now, native plants provide 15 to 35 times the caterpillar biomass versus exotics. So yeah, bird food 101. They support 4,000 native bee species that have longer flight times than honeybees and provide specific critical pollination uh, like buzz, which increases fruit yield quality and shelf life. So if you like almonds and blueberries and strawberries, you wanna have as many native bees around as possible because you're gonna get better fruit. It now, uh, our, see native plants are adapted to local regional climates. Their blooms are in sync with emerging insects and they support specialist insects that require leaves or pollen to feed their young. So we have specialist bees um, that will time their life cycles around when their preferred flowers are blooming because they will only feed that pollen to their larva. Um, of course, you know, monarch butterflies, again, poster child here for, for how this stuff works. They, will, they can only lay their eggs on milkweed because that's the only plant they can eat. Look at all the wonderful insects we can support. And again, bird food and spider food in some cases. It takes, takes a community, takes a village. Now, by 2050, over 70% of all Americans are going to live in urban areas. And these are places that have greatly diminished green space, a lot of concrete. And if you're lucky to have green space, it's mostly lawn. Now, plants clean air, water, and soil. They reduce storm runoff. Um, they cool our structures. Uh, lots of benefits to plants for infrastructure, especially in the face of climate change. Views of complex nature increase the mental and physical health of school children, office workers, and patients in hospitals. Lots of studies on this. Um, you want to know more about them, you can read my book and do garden ethic. Well-designed, diversified landscapes raise home values and spur community engagement while reducing crime. So, I mean, the, the, the it, the benefit to plants, and we're not just talking lawn or a couple of trees, we're talking diversified, thick, lush landscapes. The benefits are innumerable. We have got to stop having spaces like this. This is not sustainable. This is not healthy on any level. Let's go from this to this in our suburban environment. Let's go from this, from Nebraska State Capital, Capital to this. Oh my God, could you imagine? Oh, yay. What about our parking lot margins? We have so many parking lots with just wasted, useless space. And you, you wouldn't even want to mow this. This is actually two to one grade, so it's very sleep, steep. Let's go from this to this, which we did do. Isn't that a lot prettier? It's going to keep the soil in place. Only has to be mowed once a year. And oh my goodness, the pollinators we saw in, in, on the space in, in just its first year. Incredible. Doesn't take, it doesn't take a large area, just a small foundation planting around a front door in your home can, can work. And let's leave these gardens up for fall because they are still providing vital ecosystem services in, in the fall and winter, including keeping water on site, uh, habitat and shelter for birds and overwintering insects and frogs and spiders and all that good stuff. Yeah, thick, lush, diverse plantings. Who needs so much lawn? Nobody. Not unless you got a soccer field in your backyard. Small business there on the left, uh, suburbia there on the right. The contrast can be stark. We have to lead by example. We could do it. It's all up to you folks. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of what your neighbors think, what your HOA is going to say. Um, if you're going to get reported to weed control, you cannot be afraid. We have to start winning people's hearts and minds. We have to start getting them in touch with nature so they start to care about it, uh, see the benefits, and take action locally, regionally, nationally, globally. It all starts at home. You can do this in a shade garden as well. This is a 90% shade space. We used a lot of sedge, uh, woodland flowers that are just starting to establish in this young garden. You can do it 
anywhere, dry soil, wet soil, sun, shade, sandy, clay, loamy, doesn't matter. There are plants fitted and suited for your location. I'm just trying to inspire now with as many images as I possibly can. So yeah, thick layered gardens using native plant communities, they're gonna increase our habitat and climate resilience and it's gonna minimize the need for weeding, mulching, and watering. I know maybe you're looking at these landscapes I've shown you already, and you're thinking, wow, that looks like a lot of work. I'm not a gardener, I have a brown thumb. You know, where, where, where's the buzzer? Eh. No, these are actually quite simple once they're established and what they get, once they get going. Um, when we are modeling our gardens off of wild natural plant communities, we, we find around us in, in undisturbed sites, sustainable sites, like uh, I got prairies near my house. When we are modeling our gardens after the plants and the assemblages we find in these wilder landscapes. Um, We're gonna find that these plants will basically take care of themselves. They will stabilize themselves. They will find their way. They will mix and mingle, reproduce, die, um, but they are gonna create a dynamic, thriving, lush landscape. They, you do not have to mulch it. You do not have to water once established. And after a couple of years, weeding will be almost zero. Um, your biggest weeding pressure um, out here in the plains for us, it is definitely trees. Uh, red cedar, which is a native tree, but also some uh, invasive elm trees. Uh, and uh, what was the other one? Mulberry. Yeah. Now, when I say layers, this is what I mean. Wonderful visual graphic for my friends, uh, Thomas and Claudia, from their book, Planting in the Post Wild World. Uh, where you're going to have the most plants is in the ground cover layer. So if you walk into a meadow or prairie, you're going to see mostly grasses that are somewhat short. That's, that's going to be the main plant layer. And then you have your seasonal theme layer, which is masses and drifts and individuals of flowers that are uh, species that are blooming from April all the way through October and November. Uh, they won't all be blooming at the same time, right? And then you have your structural layer. So taller plants, uh, maybe sh small shrubs, small trees or tall trees even, tall perennials like Joe pie weed or tall coreopsis. Um, these are those herbaceous perennials that get six to eight feet tall. Um, those will actually be the species, uh, it'll be the least amount of species in that structural layer. So this is what makes a sustainable landscape, resilient and, and providing the most ecosystem uh, functions, again, which is absorbing rainfall, storm runoff, cooling our, our buildings, cleaning our air, cleaning our soil, providing habitat for wildlife. So let's study and learn from those wild native plant communities. Do you see any wood mulch in this restored prairie that was seeded? No, 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 no. But you can see how the plants, you can learn from the plants, how they like to grow, how they are assembled. Notice that Asclepius tuberosa, orange butterfly weed, uh, does you, I mean, you walk in any prairie, you will not see it in masses or drifts. It, it's a little bit of a loner, scattered individuals here and there. So don't put them together in your home landscape, scatter them around because that's how they like to grow. So we can mimic uh, these features in our urban and suburban landscapes. Sometimes we can turn it up a little bit. Um, there are some plants that you may see them scattered in, in a prairie, but they will do fine drifted and massed, massed together. Uh, coneflowers could be one for sure. Our pycnathemum or mountain mints could tend to work like that. Blue mistflower, conoclinium colistinum. So how do we prairie up? How do we convert our lawns to these meadow, these designed meadow and prairie gardens? So plant flowers and drifts and masses. So that could be three, five, 15 of a kind. It really depends on how large your landscape is. The smaller your bed is, um, the lower that number is gonna be, just because that shows design and tension. If you just throw out a bag of seed, it's gonna look like somebody threw up over the landscape and you're not gonna know what you get. So use paths, benches, arbors, and sculptures to invite humans in. This is something called uh, cues to care. When we show that humans have access to a space that it is designed for them, even though it looks a little bit different and maybe even a little bit threatening because it, because it appears to be so wild and untamed, um, the people can accept the space a little bit more easily. What really works is placing a sign explaining the purpose of the landscape and the benefit of the transition from lawn to a natural landscape. And this is maybe some people think this is cheating a little bit, but it really works. Keep plants at a lower uniform average height. I like to design front yard gardens where the plants, the majority of the plants are in a two to three foot tall range. Um, and may even have 50% of them that are more like 12 to 18 inches tall. 
uh, for some reason we're intimidated by plants. So let's not have them be tall, so, you know, falling over into the sidewalk, block, blocking sight lines or people pouring out of the driveways or trying to make a turn on a corner. Keep the plants low and approachable. If you want to use taller plants, put them in the middle and back of beds. That's traditional landscape design right there. More encouragement, I hope for you. You want some lawn? This is how we can keep it. Have a six foot wide lawn path going up through the middle of two wilder beds. It shows design attention, it shows access, it ties into the larger suburban landscape where everybody else has lawns and says, hey, I can play too. I'm with you. Now some methods to remove lawns. So quick, quick few uh, practical uh, suggestions here. Uh, I prefer one of these and <laughs> I sometimes get in trouble for it, but that's okay, make good trouble. Sheet mulch is one way to do it. And that's if you're putting cardboard down over the grass, uh, maybe some topsoil mulch on, on, on top, but you gotta let that sit for a year before it's fully broken down and kills everything. And it's, it's really impractical for large areas if you're using cardboard and newspaper. Um, you're practically gonna have to go buy a bunch of cardboard and newspaper. Solarizing is another thing uh, method people use. It's using either black plastic, opaque plastic, or clear plastic over a landscape. Now that just totally roasts the soil, kills all the soil life. You have a ton of plastic waste. What do you do with all that plastic um, after you're done using it? And then this one really takes an entire growing, growing, growing season to work. So put it down in spring. Um, you got to leave it down throughout the whole growing season. It's actually advisable to put it down for a month, take it off for two weeks, let weeds germinate, put the plastic back on, kill them, and repeat that several times. Sod cutter works, and it gives you immediate results, right? Um, but there's all that nasty exhaust coming from the machine. The machine is very unwieldy and can be hard for some people to use, especially if you have uh, back conditions or knee conditions. And then it creates soil disturbance. I am not a fan of soil disturbance because that just uh, exposes more weeds uh, to sunlight. So they're gonna germinate. You're, you're turning up the soil a little bit, bringing um, weed seeds up more closer to the surface so they can germinate because you're getting that sunlight. It's just not good. It does not work for me. I've had a lot of failures with it. That's another reason why you do not want to rototill. Rototilling has got to be the worst thing because not only are you bringing this weed seeds up to the surface to germinate, but you're, you're destroying the soil profile, the soil structure, and the layers that make the soil work, as well as harming the soil microbes in there. I prefer spray killing. You can plant two weeks straight into a dead lawn. So just one quick, easy application. It's affordable. Um, it, it, it's, it's, you know, if you have uh, physical limitations, uh, this is the easiest way to go. And dead lawn helps control weeds and hold soil in place. So especially if you have a slope or you have some drainage issues, you know, not disturbing the site is going to minimize erosion. Dead lawn is great. It's a natural it's a natural erosion control blanket. And again, yeah, it is going to reduce weed competition because you still have the dead lawn on there shading the soil surface, even after planting. So I love it, breaks down in a year. You can do one inch layer of wood mulch on top of that for aesthetic reasons if you want to. Um, but if you're seeding, you're not gonna wanna do that obviously because prairie seed needs light to germinate. So here are some ways to approach planning your landscape. If you, if you like to put it down on paper, you can just go really loose there on the left. You can get really formal, formal on the right, knowing that each circle represents so many plants that are gonna be put together. Using plugs is the preferred method to do these kind of landscapes because we're using so many plants and plugs are small, so they're easier to put in the ground. We will put them 12 inches apart, sometimes eight or 10 inches apart, you can get 2.5 inch containers or you can get like uh, three to four to six inch deep plugs, um, but they are certainly more affordable. Why buy one gallon plants that are 15 to $20 and take 10 minutes to plant, they're so big, uh, which you certainly don't wanna do in clay soil, right? Who wants to do all that digging, deep digging in clay soil? But why have a one gallon plant when you can have five to 10 for the same price? And plugs establish pretty quickly, right? Because they have, they have good, you can see on these plugs, they have good root mass, good, good root zones. Um, and, and since they are a smaller uh, plant, they can establish faster because they're not in, in as much shock. So after a couple of weeks, these plants tend to be good to go unless we have a severe drought right afterwards. So we're talking a couple of weeks of watering. If you plant them in the fall, we're talking one or two waterings if you get typical autumn rains. 
Here's your size difference, right? You do not wanna plant hundreds of one gallon pots in your landscape. I'd rather plant two 50 plug trays there on the right. Way easier. And way less plastic trash. So here you go. Uh, I'm showing you here something called matrix planting. It is the best way to create a natural landscape. It's gonna fill it in quick, and that way it helps out compete weeds, shade the soil, and increase your soil moisture because the soil is getting shaded uh, usually in the first year. So here, this is our matrix of grasses or sedges planted 12 inches apart. So that's your base layer, that's your ground layer. Remember that graphic I showed you several slides ago where we're looking at the different layers. Well, this is, your, this is the one where you're having your most plants, your base layer. We can come in, we can add our flower masses and drifts. You may wanna do more than this, you may wanna do less. It certainly depends on your ecosystem and your ecoregion and your aesthetic goals. Tools, my favorite tool is to use a drill and a three inch auger. Now, some of the all-purpose consumer drills can work in looser soil, like a loam or a silty clay loam, something like that. But for hardcore clay, a mixing drill is going to be best as it has a lot more torque and less RPM. If you have a high RPM tool, man, you're just going to be throwing soil all over the place and the, and the torque isn't going to be high enough to get into that thick, sticky clay. Um, this is a more expensive drill. A corded is probably going to be $150. Uh, cordless will probably be twice that amount, plus the cost of additional batteries. But make sure whatever you do to use a solid steel auger bit so it won't break in clay or rock. So do your research. Employ those grasses and sedges as a living green mulch to replace wood mulch. It's okay to have a one inch layer of wood mulch at plant installation to help reduce some of that early weed competition the first year or two, but you don't have to put it down again. Let the plants take over. That biggest labor of the first year is going to be removing perennial weeds. It's just a fact. Anytime you have any kind of disturbance on the site, no matter what it is, you're going to be fighting weeds, but most of them tend to be annuals like crabgrass and foxtail. So know your weeds and know how to manage them. Once desirable plants begin to fill in and spread, I mean, we're talking even just the second year, you're gonna see at least a 50% reduction in any weeding that you have to do. And here's an important caveat. Don't pull the weeds out of the soil. When you pull a rooted plant out of the ground, what happens? You bring a lot of soil around its root mass up with it. And that's disturbing the site once again. Right? So it's like you're starting from over. You're bringing those weed seeds to the surface. More are going to germinate. Just clip off the flower heads or the seed heads so they don't spread more seed. Annuals are going to be done doing it probably by August, if not the, or September, probably most of them by August or July. Uh, perennials, different beast um, treatment will depend on what perennials you have, like quack grass might need to require more aggressive chemical treatment. Management, man, what does it look like? Don't mow your garden down in the fall and winter. Again, let it stand up so it can keep providing all kinds of beneficial ecosystem services. Mow it down instead in uh, spring. Depending on where you are, southern U.S. or northern U.S., that could be January, February, March, maybe even early April. Our backyard prairie, that's about 2,500, 3,000 square feet, just go down, scalp it every mid-March to late March. Uh, bag up the detritus and compost it or just toss it in case there's too many seeds in there. I'd love to burn, but you can't burn within city limits. A burn every three years would really rejuvenate the space and, in space and increase uh, the diversity and number of flowers. Now lawns may seem easier to manage because we grew up caring for them. We all went through the ritual of dad or mom making us go outside to mow. So we already know what a lawn is and know how to take care of it. You know, mowing every week at the same height, or if you're some of my neighbors, mowing three times a week, watering, fertilizing on a schedule whenever the TV ads tell us, this is how we maintain a lawn. We know it, we're familiar with it, it's safe, but it's just not environmentally friendly at all. Managing a more diverse garden does mean knowing the plants, letting them teach you what they want over time and be willing to go with the flow as the landscape changes month to month and year to year. Now that's exciting. Plants are not static statues that stay in the same place forever. I mean, we don't, right? Let them teach you where they wanna go. 
don't over control them. Don't be upset when something dies or when something moves. It's telling you important information. Just observe it. You don't have to be out there every day observing it. Just walk through the garden for five minutes once a week and you've already learned so much. A natural garden really is not more work than a lawn. It's often a lot less than a few years because you're not mowing it every week. You don't have to water it because you've matched your plants to the site, to the soil and the sunlight and to one another. So choose the right plants from the start. I think with, with sustainable, low maintenance, a healthy garden design, 75% uh, of the battle or something isn't choosing the right plants before you ever put something in the ground. More inspiration, midsummer, late summer, still doing wonderful, beautiful, healthy things deep into autumn. And even deeper into winter, right? Isn't that beautiful? So much prettier to see hoarfrost on all these different uh, grass and flower species than on a four inch clipped lawn. Come on, let's do it. You know you want to. You can do it on larger acreage lots, right? I think this was a this was at least a one acre lot. We just did a border all the way around the three sides of the back. Couldn't have been more than 20 to 30 feet deep. Oh yeah, there is fire in the autumn garden. And it's not just trees. We always think of trees as, and shrubs as having the fall color, but it's also the perennials and the grasses and, and the flowers and the annual flowers. All their leaves are changing all kinds of different wonderful hues. Let's rethink pretty in our urban environments. Are you ready? Gosh. I know I am. Every second of every day, even when I'm asleep, I'm ready. Just wake me up. Ring the doorbell. Let's go. D-Lawn. Again, rethink pretty. It's up to you guys. Change. Change is so good. I know it's hard, but it's, but it's so good. So start the fight out front. Start the battle. Start, start creating freedom and liberty in whatever space you have. Thank you.